Eddie is soldiers. But Rachel, Halloween ended last week. First of all, spooky season is all year round. Second of all, this is just what my house looks like. This video is going up a little later than I would usually post, but I've been busy this week. I've been doing this thing called going to work. And last weekend I was running around a lot of graveyards. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. You could even say I'm dead serious. What is my hair doing? It's like a 70s curl, but then it's giving like a hard 2011 side bang. Welcome friends, enemies, Romans, to my spooky scary October reading wrap up. As I look at my list of things to talk about, I realize that the only things I read this month were horror novels and smut. I did some wild card vampires, I did some cute queer romances, and I did a bunch of horror novellas that I'm still not sure how I feel about. So without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and buckle in as we go over the... Uh, hold on. Two, four, six... Technically nine, but eight books that I managed to read in the month of October. I say technically nine because I also read Gwen and Art Are Not In Love by Les Croucher. However, there is currently a boycott on St. Martin's Press and Wednesday books, uh, but I read this just before that boycott happened. So I will not be talking about my thoughts in this, and I hope that they can get their shit together and actually do what needs to be done because what the hell you guys. So when they finally decide to stand against racism again, I will review this book. The first book is one that I specifically picked up because my friend Alex sent me a screenshot of one of the sex scenes in it and I needed to know more. <laughs> and not because it was like, ooh, salacious and sexual, like, mm, shadow daddy, no, no, no. I, it, because it was weird and I was like, I'm gonna put my investigative journalism hat on and like figure out what the hell is going on here. So this review I dedicate to you, Alex. It is Serpent on the Wings of Night by Carissa Broadbent. This is a fantasy vampire Hunger Games-esque romanticy that I had seen on TikTok and I was intrigued before I even knew about weird descriptions of men's body parts. Our main character, Araya, is the human-born daughter of the Nightborn Vampire King. And he has been training her in weaponry and fighting her whole life so that she can defend herself against the vampire courts, but also so that she can enter the Kajari, which are a series of Hunger Games-esque trials, where all the heirs and warriors of the vampire houses compete, and whoever is left standing gets a favor from their goddess herself. But as the trials begin and she realizes that she is way over her head, she becomes unlike likely allies with a rival vampire, and the two of them are fighting in the trials and against their own hearts as she finds out more and more about a rebellion brewing in the city. This book is deceptively gory. It is surprisingly bloody. The world of this is so cool. The vampire hier hier hierarchies? Am I okay? Vampire hierarchies are so intricate and the politics are bloody and this whole religious aspect and like religious systems of worship is honestly really fucked up and awesome. These vampires are dangerous. They are predators. The older they get, like age smooths them out. So they become more beautiful the older and more dangerous they get. And because our main character has grown up in this environment, she's constantly like on edge and twitchy. So you as the reader are also on edge and twitchy. And the sex scenes, you know, the reason that I rushed to pick this up because of very weird dick descriptions. Actually, we're kind of good. <laughs> really nice to read this scene where a male body is romanticized. So a lot of romance books and particularly fantasy romance books have a main male character love interest be like, oh, he's so tall and his jaw's so sharp and he's so muscly and hard. And then they talk about, you know, being like domineering and that like those types of harsh words. So hearing a woman talk about how beautiful this man was, was a very refreshing change and also because this male character has so many body issues due to his past, it was also like a healing moment for him too. It was like, it was a really good sex scene. My main issue with this book is kind of hard to explain, so I'm gonna try my best. Her writing is good. Like reading a paragraph, I was like, that's a nice paragraph. But altogether, somehow, it just felt clunky, but it wasn't like she was shoving characters together or that the plotline didn't make sense or things weren't foreshadowed. I can't tell. Pacing is probably the issue. Like this wasn't very well paced. I didn't love where all the relationship statuses were at the end of this book, but oh my God, the ending was, 
it was pretty great. <laughs> so yeah, I really liked this book. I'm definitely gonna be picking up the sequel when it comes out. Excuse this random freeze frame. I had to move some lights around while filming this and the quality of this next portion is lower than before. I'm sorry, you're just gonna have to deal. The second book is one I was also influenced to buy by a friend. Uh, my book talk mutual, Emma Skies, talked about loving this book and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Did I hear something about bone magic? If Emma Skies herself says that there is a book that is Gideon the Ninth meets Game of Thrones you know I'm gonna buy it. And I am so glad that an influencer influenced me because I found one of my new favorite books this month. It is Bonesmith by Nikki Palpretto. The Dominions is a kingdom where the dead will not stay dead. And so there are people called Bonesmiths and Reapers that go around severing souls from the actual dead bodies. But our main character, Ren, who is heir to the House of Bone, is sabotaged during her ritual initiation and is banished to guard the Border Wall, which is the last remaining defense against hordes of the undead. However, when a prince from the House of Gold is kidnapped and taken beyond the wall by bandits, she decides that to restore her family's faith and her good honor and her good name that she is going to go after him and bring him back. However, as you can maybe guess, everything goes wrong and she is separated from her group and then has to form an unlikely alliance, one of the bandits from the estranged House of Iron, to be able to go and get the prince back. However, as these two enemies travel the breach together, they start to form an unlikely alliance and maybe more. And more and more evidence for an uprising within the kingdom is becoming clear to them so they are both trying to save a prince, but also save themselves and both of their houses. With our main character being a badass bitch bonesmith who wields two giant swords of bone and is walking around with a permanent smoky eye and a dark lip. Like, I love that for her. The smithing magic of this world is very unique and very cool. Like, all the ironsmith weaponry that they can control and manipulate into different objects. The ghost smiths being able to see, like, how someone died and how to separate a soul. The spirits of people who died violently have an anchor bone that keeps them in this world and refuses to leave its body, it can become a zombie creature and you can't kill a ghost when it's in its shell. So you have to like draw the ghost out and then, then you can kill it. And you know me, I love an enemies to lovers plotline and Julian was a great great male lead. I thought that he was very nuanced, very determined, very hell-bent on revenge and justice. But the wild card character I really, really loved was Leo, who is our kidnapped golden prince. I didn't even realize we we're gonna get a POV from him, but we do and I love him. He is smart and conniving and sassy. He reminds me of Nikolai Lanslov from the Shadow and Bone series, and I think that's why I love him so much. Some great twisty twists, some really good pacing of the reveals, and then the double reveals. I did think parts of the ending were predictable, especially once we hit the second half. That being said, this is a reluctant trio that I would follow to the ends of the breach. Now, one of the things that I keep doing to myself is I keep making myself read short stories when I know that I don't like short stories. I just wanna be like the cool kids, okay? I wanna be able to enjoy these little snippets of stuff, but in my want to be cool and my need to be spooky, I ended up reading two short horror stories this month. The first being yet another one of the Amazon original Into Shadows collection, this time being what to the Dead Know by Nevo. In this series, I've also read Six Deaths of the Saint by Alex E. Harrow and Undercover by Tamsin Muir. And I would say What the Dead Know is solidly in the middle. I don't think anything will ever top Six Deaths of the Saint though. Change my mind. Now, Nevo knows how to write a novel and damn, does she know how to write a short story. And this follows two ex sideshow employees around the turn of the century as a woman who pretends to be a medium comes face to face with the actual ghosts of a house. Maris is a Vietnamese woman who uses her exotic foreignness to add to the seance act that she and her partner Vassil put on but it is only ever an act. Until one night at the Fog School Cemetery Finishing School for young girls where they are there to put on an act as part of a charity dinner, the lights go out and weird things start happening within this gothic seminary school. This world is vaguely magical and I think I would have liked it a little bit more if it had been more magical. Like at the school, the girls that are there to entertain people all have these little crowns of fireflies. And when they first get to the school, there's a big river that Maris and Vasily cross 
across and Maris notices that there are a bunch of drowned women waving at her from beneath the water. And I'm like, how do you know that? There's discussion on the exoticization of Asian women, particularly in circuses and freak shows. We go into the mechanics of these fraud seances that were big in the Victorian era. And once the ghosts show up, this was a heart pounding ending, but I would have liked it to be creepier. I think this should have been creepier. It's a horror short story. It's a horror anthology. Didn't love it, didn't hate it. This was just kind of like a fun thing that I read on the bus um, on my way to dance class and home again. So yeah, it was good. It was spooky. The second novella that I finished, I finished on Halloween. So Tor sent me a copy of A Season of Monstrous Conceptions by Linda Rather, which is an eldritch historical fantasy set in the 1600s in London, where suddenly babies are starting to be born with eldritch monstrous deformities, like too many eyes or gills instead of lungs. And our main character, Sarah, is a young midwife's apprentice who herself has a touch of magic or a touch of the other place, she gets caught in a power struggle and a web of lies and intrigue and magic when she gets hired to be Lady Wren's personal midwife and her very eccentric husband who's a little too interested in her abilities. Also, it's gay. Now ask somebody who does not want children and does not like the idea of pregnancy um, and absolutely does not like pregnant body horror. I was a little worried going into this, but thankfully there is no baby and or pregnant women body horror. Babies themselves, just a little weird looking, like they don't do anything. Instead, we get the small magics of celestial spheres and accidentally ripping open portals to other worlds as one does, which is trying to band together to make a midwife union. Hellish demons roaming the streets and yet also the warmth and magic of the underground queer community. One thematic aspect I really liked in this is the idea that both women and men can be born with the magic of the other place, but because men look for power in different places, they don't usually tap into their own magic. And that's why women are often magical or tried as witches or burned at the stake, because that's the only way that they can access power. But speaking of accessing power, goddamn, we got some grade one, grade A, S tier girl bosses in this book, because one of them literally bursts the Antichrist. And what's it like to be the end of the world? Really embody that. Like, what am I over here trying to do becoming a CEO? Like, there's no upping that. I guess that's really just the power of manifestation. Get to pull in some Lovecraftian exploits, and then we get like a little queer romance on the side as a treat. A look at women's spaces and women's power in both midwifery and witchcraft. So like, yeah, literally slay. Next up is a book for all my Wattpad and werewolf-loving girlies, and not in the way that you expect. I won't lie to you, I am no stranger to Wattpad. Had. I used to love that platform so much. It was one of the first places I ever posted my writing. It was a great writing community, but it is notorious for a reason. And one of the genres of notoriety is questionable supernatural, usually fan fiction stories. <laughs> when author Z.W. Taylor asked if I wanted to read her book, The Bite, which is a werewolf book that explores grief and healing against domestic abuse in a isolated cabin in Alaska, I was like, you have my intention, what? So thank you to the author and Wattpad for sending me a copy of this because this is a great subversion and twist on the classic werewolf novel and I freaking loved it. Charlie is trying to escape an abusive relationship so she has taken her car and is driving to a friend's cabin in the middle of Alaska in hopes to get away and start fresh. But on her way there, she's attacked by a pack of rogue wolves and one of them bites her. And when she wakes up, it turns out Guess what, girl? Surprise, you're gonna be a werewolf now. She gets taken in by a werewolf hermit and his vampire roommate who live in another cabin in the woods. And the two of them are trying to prepare her for her, her eventual transformation while she's also working through guilt and loss and fear from her old life. And this is my own fault for stereotyping and assuming things from looking at a Wattpad book and being like, oh, that'll be like a fun little romp. And it was not. An in-depth look on the conflicted emotional state of someone who is fleeing an abusive relationship and like the guilt that they feel and the anger towards themselves, how hard it is to leave and how hard it is to reconnect with the community again. And the werewolf transformation in this book is gruesome. Oh my God, I would not want to go through that. I actually kind of love this take on it where the transformation takes place over three full moons after you were bitten. And each of those transformations will take you closer to being a full wolf. Some people are born with the werewolf gene. Some people can be bitten and turned into a werewolf, but a lot of people that are bitten and turned don't survive. Truly, fuck the moon, that bitch. I don't know about the sequel, but there is absolutely no romance in this book. And I also 
Really enjoyed that. Like, let our main character deal with her feelings, process her emotions without having to worry about some hot guy walking around shirtless. But the idea of a soulmate or the soulmate trope did come up, which everyone knows usually I despise. But instead of instant attraction romance, our main character is angry because it conflicts with her wanting independence and freedom after a bad relationship. Also surprisingly cozy at times because of this like, grumpy sunshine, two gay dads vibe that the two like main mentor figures have with her. So we have a werewolf book that isn't sexy, that instead deep dives into like your own mental healing processes after going through a tough time in your life and using werewolves as an allegory. Like, bravo Wattpad, this book rocks. Now, if you've watched my most recent thrift haul, you will have seen this book in there. And yes, I did read it. And no, I have not further thought about the connotations of having this book in my house. So at Value Village the other day, I managed to find a copy of Priest by Sierra Simone. <laughs> this is Priest Smut. I know, as an atheist, I don't know what that says about me either. I actually read this a couple of years ago, but I've never owned a physical copy. So thanks to whoever donated this. <laughs> Our main character is a priest named Tyler, which I'm not gonna comment on. And he is doing his best to be a good boy in the eyes of God, despite having a very high sex drive. And then, oh my God, this super sexy lady moves to town and they hit it off immediately. And then there's a lot of shenanigans involving religious iconography. Is this ridiculous? Yes. Is this hot? Also, yes. We got that sexy, sexy Catholic guilt. Once again, forgive me father for I have sinned is not the same as, sorry daddy, I've been naughty. Oh, I shouldn't let the internet have that sound bite of me. Okay, Sierra Simone is a romance icon. She can write some hot stuff. The sexy times are phenomenal. And I do like that she addressed like religious guilt when it comes to sex. I did struggle a little bit with the derogatory names, which like, if it's for you, it's for you, but it's not for me. Like if someone calls me something mean, I will cry. So I like this. And if you want to work out some religious trauma, maybe go for it. <laughs> Find yourself a person worth sitting for. That's my takeaway. And then after finishing that, I was still in the mood for a book to seduce me. So I went to, you know, tried and true, favorite, my love, uh, Kindle Unlimited, and picked up Madame from Sarah Kate. This is part of the SPC series. I wrote the acronym and I don't remember what it stands for. This is sixth in the Salacious Players Club series. I think I've read two or three of these before, but it's just, you know, shenanigans and plot line that happens to people who are all either running or involved in the this exclusive kink club. We follow three characters. First of all, we have Madame, aka Eden St. Clair, who is a professional dom. We also follow Clay, who used to have a relationship with Madame a few years ago until they both fell in love and she cut it off. And we also have Jade, who's Clay's new girlfriend, who is feeling insecure about her place in the world and wanting to explore her own idea of what being dominant and being a sort of means to her. I have some complicated feelings about this book because while it was very hot, we have a great MFF poly threesome. I did appreciate kink being shown as a way for someone to explore themselves emotionally and let their guard down in a non-sexual way because not all kink is sexual and in fact can be very deeply emotional. It shows the very, very rare occasion where opening the relationship actually fixes it. And for whatever reason, this smutty poly book has one of the best dad figures in fiction. Like what the hell? Jade's dad is so great. <laughs> However, I actually almost DNF this book halfway through because the boundary pushing was out of this world and not in a good way. Kink is a place where a lot of people explore and set up boundaries. And not only in a physical sense, but also in an emotional or like societal social sense. And Clay will not stop pushing Eden's boundaries. My dude, you entered into this relationship as a client. Like this is a working relationship. She is working right now. And he gets so pissy that she won't share her real name or anything about her real life with him. Like one of the reasons that he brings up being mad at her after breaking off their relationship is that she never told him that she had a kid. And I'm like, that child is like seven years old and you are a man. You only meet this woman in like one very particular setting. Why in the world should she trust you to tell her about her child? I'm like, yeah, eventually 
eventually the two of them reconcile and start an actual relationship and he becomes this wonderful stand-in father figure for this child. But like, my guy, that is not okay. And it's definitely not okay because you're the person who is coming to her. She doesn't owe you shit. <sighs> Anyways, it is the last of the series. So I don't know, maybe I'll go back and read the other ones. I like a lot of the side characters enough. It was good in some ways and it was not my favorite in others. And lastly is one of, yet again, my new favorite books of the year. I finished this in a day and a half. It's absolutely no surprise to anybody. It's Iris Kelly Doesn't Date by Ashley Herring Blake. <laughs> this is the third of the Bright Falls series, AKA the sapphic rom-com trilogy that I have been loving. It started with Delilah Green Doesn't Care, followed up with Astrid Parker Doesn't Fail, and now thirdly, Iris Kelly Doesn't Date. This was more theatrical, more queer, and more ridiculous than the other two, and I am here for it. Everyone around Iris Kelly is falling in love, and she is not having it. She's tired of her mom trying to set her up with people, her friends are getting married, and she's feeling very left out, and she's a romance writer who has no idea what to write for her second novel. So one night she goes out clubbing and takes home a sexy stranger from the bar, only to have the actual worst hookup she's ever had, which is then made worse by running into said hookup the next day at a theater audition. And Stevie is a struggling actress who is going through a bit of a mid-twenties crisis. She has an anxiety disorder that she's trying to deal with while all these big changes are being pushed on her in her life. And to save face in front of her friends, she asks Iris to be her fake girlfriend for the production length, uh, and Iris agrees. But of course, as we continue to get to know each other, chemistry flares and maybe we're not acting on our feelings at all. Now, I know some people did not like this conclusion to the series, but I loved it. And I am very biased because this is a queer retelling of Much Ado About Nothing, and that is my favorite Shakespeare play. Also, yes, more rom-coms about women who don't want marriage and babies 2024. This was a good balance of these ridiculously outlandish, grand romantic rom-com gestures that border on obnoxious, combined with a deeper look into anxiety and toxic friendship dynamics and imposter syndrome. Iris learns to accept the love that's in her life and realize her own self-worth, gains the confidence of not being afraid to try new things that she might fail at. And Stevie turns from a useless bottom into a confident thespian switch. I love that for her. Romance isn't dead, my darlings. I absolutely adored this book. If you liked the other Bright Falls books, you have to pick it up. It just made my little theater kid heart so happy. And that is that on that. Ooh, I'm at a spicy 9% camera battery. Okay, let's see if I can do this before I run out. Thank you all for joining me this evening as we talked about all the books that I managed to read in the month of October, 2023. And I hope you all had a good Halloween. Uh, my girlfriend and I ran around in some graveyards being festive. And then I ended up having a Halloween party at my house where we made spooky cocktails and played some Halloween games and it was a grand old ghosty time. Truly, where has the year gone? It's already November and I'm already like fully booked until Christmas. How did this happen? I'm gonna have to get on it because there's a whole stack of things that I want to be able to finish before the end of the year. Oh, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it but I'm damn well gonna try. Just yesterday I went to Winners and then cleared out the shelf of all of their discounted Halloween flavor coffees. So I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna finish this tea and then go out grocery shopping because I ended up buying a lot of coffee and not much else on that gro grocery run. <laughs> you know where I clicked like the video. You know where I clicked to subscribe. I hope you guys are all having a nice day or night wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye.